Well, good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible. And you can join me in the book of 1 Peter there in the New Testament. And if you're a guest today or even a regular attender, there's, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's a Bible there in the pew. If you need it, use that today. And if you need some help finding 1 Peter, it's on page 1,075. I'm going to take a sip of this water real quick. <clears throat> well, it's Labor Day weekend, and so I hope that you are having some time to spend some time just relaxing and resting and seeing family. And if you are uh, a guest today, if you're family from out of town visiting someone, we're so glad you joined us for worship this morning. And we've been walking through a series called A Non-Anxious Presence. And as we think about uh, the world that we live in, there are so many things that we can certainly be anxious about, whether it be from afar or maybe right even here in our own community, um, perhaps in your own life. All of us face things that are unknown and those unknown things tend to cause us to worry, don't they? They cause us to um, be anxious. And as believers, we have a hope that goes beyond <clears throat> this world. We have a hope that is secure, that is anchored in what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. And this anchor, it secures us. And so as a people who are not dependent upon uh, this world, as a people who um, are not tossed back and forth by the ways of this world, this anchor secures us in a way where we can be a non-anxious presence in a world that's ridden by anxiety. And that is our hope for this church. Uh, that is my hope for you as an individual. And chances are there's all kinds of things you're worried about when you walk through these doors. Um, but there is hope. And you don't have to be ruled by those worries. And that's what Peter is trying to help these believers do. Um, we've said over the past few weeks, he's writing to uh, believers that are living in the north east corner of the Roman Empire. There's not empire, persecution across the empire as a whole. It's really pockets of persecution throughout the empire. But we know that this was a difficult place to live in a difficult time. And things were only going to get worse. In fact, um, there would be some very harsh persecution coming um, a believer's way, the church's way in, in the years ahead. And so they had many things to fear. Uh, and um, even being a believer themselves, they would be cast away from their community. Many of the um, gatherings in the communities of the Roman Empire would be surrounded by worship of pagan gods. Uh, they would get together and have a party and celebrate a particular um, uh, pagan god or, or worship. And their communities were undergirded by these, these religious undertones to these, uh, once again, these deities, these foreign deities. And so if you were a Christian, then you were exclusive, right? You claimed Christ and Christ alone. And because of that, you had to withdraw much of the community that you had lived in your whole life. And so there's, we, we, it's hard for us to really understand that, but they would have been outsiders. Um, in fact, Peter calls them exiles. Um, they were those who were living in a place uh, that, that was no longer their home. And, um, and so for us this morning, we talked about that's the same thing. We, you know, we, we, this world is not our home. And we need to be careful how much we seek to find our comfort and our hope in the things of this world. And so let's read together. We're going to continue reading in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. And Peter writes these words. He says, therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially, according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. 
Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray together. Fathers, we bow our heads in this morning. Uh, we know that your word has been proclaimed across the globe today. And we praise you for that. We praise you that uh, for the pastors who are standing up in churches like these and house churches and in open areas, Lord, and proclaiming your truth. And Father, we pray as we open your word this morning that um, your truth would fall upon receptive hearts. Lord, that we not only hear with our ears, but Lord, that we would take it in, Lord, and it would shape and mold us and change us more into the image of your son. And we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Well, many of you were uh, probably watched the Olympics this past month. And uh, the Olympics, there's, there's nothing like them. Uh, just those moments of intensity where you have an athlete for, you know, three, three and a half years, four years, really their whole life. But we know the Olympics happened every four years. And so you have some of these summer Olympians, right, who been training for four years for this one particular moment. Now, we know there are races throughout the year, but most of them, their, their goal in training is to win a medal, to, to win a gold Olympic medal. And, uh, you know, one of the most intense uh, Olympic events, I think, is that 100-meter sprint. And I can just imagine, right, them getting in the block. I mean, this, uh, they've been training, once again, their whole life, sacrifices they've been making. I remember hearing the um, Michael Phelps, you know, he was the most decorated men's athlete, Olympic athlete. He was a swimmer and, you know, he would get up at 6 a.m. and spend like seven or eight um, hours in the pool and he would take a two-hour nap. Most of us could do that. Um, and then he would eat eight to 10,000 calories. Most of us could do that. But um, he had to do that just because he was doing so much training that he would not lose weight, right? And he had to eat eight to 10,000 calories. And, and so these athletes, they're, they're going to very, very strict training and they have this laser focus. And once again, I think one of the most intense moments is that, you know, is that guy getting ready to do that 100 meter sprint, he bows down or he kneels down, he has his foot in the block and he's just waiting. Like his mind is completely set on hearing that gun go off, that starting gun, because he knows that every, right, every millisecond, every movement he makes matters. That race isn't that long compared to some of the other races. So every movement matters. He has to be set. His mind has to be set. And in the same way, I think that's exactly what Peter is encouraging these believers in these churches to do, to set their minds. That word literally means to gird up their loins, gird up the loins of their mind. The loins would have been these robes that they wore. And so if they were getting ready to do an athletic event or some type of exercise, they would take their robes and tuck them up and... And that way they would focus not only their body, but their minds in prepare, preparation of what they were getting ready to do. And this is what Peter is saying. Listen, in light of, look what he says. There. He says, therefore, he's, he's referring back to everything he's just said, every, everything we've just talked about over the past several weeks, that they have been saved by God. They've been called out by God, chosen by God to be his children, to receive this great salvation uh, we focused a lot on that last week, that their hope is no longer in this world, but it's in the, it's in the one to come, right? And Jesus Christ, and, and one day that he's going to return and make all things right. That is their hope. And that uh, for, for one day in the future, that is their hope there in the moment. And they are to set their minds on this hope. And when you're to set your minds, he's going to go on to say, when you set your minds on this hope, right, this hope of Jesus, some things... Uh, in this life don't make sense anymore. Uh, in the same way that if you were an uh, Olympian and you traveled to, to Paris, France, and you went into the Olympic Village, and you're pre you've been preparing for years to race, and you're thinking about this one moment where you have, right, 10 seconds to capture a gold medal, um, some things don't make sense. You know, you're, gonna, you're not going to stay up late, you know, eating pizza. Um, you're not going to um, just go out and do whatever you want to do. No, because you're so focused on the goal, some things you don't do because they just don't fit in with that goal. And I think that's ultimately what Peter is helping them and leading them to see here. Set your minds on this hope that you have in Jesus Christ, not only what he's done, but the fact that he's going to return again. 
had this confident expectation in a way that it changes the way you, you think and ultimately it will change the way that you live. If your hope, if our hope is set upon Jesus Christ, then some things in this world, they don't just, they don't make sense anymore. They don't line up for us as it would others who live in this world. And he goes on to instruct them what some of these things are. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. Now, what is he talking about when he says these, these desires? Well, he lists some of these over. If you continue reading in 1 Peter, he lists some of these in 1 Peter chapter 4. He talks about uh, drunkenness and sexual morality and carousing and lawless idolat- idolatry. And ultimately, I would say you could sum up those things by saying that they're desires driven by selfish longings of our, of our flesh. Right? Idolatry is, is when we put anything before God, isn't it? That's, that's making an idol of something. And think about this. Think about where much of our anxiety, where does it spring from? It springs from things we desire. It springs from things that we want that we, that we don't have. Much of our anxiety is born out of, uh, of our dependence, maybe a misplaced hope on something that we think we, we really, really need. Um, later on in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, he'll talk, once again, he'll talk about these desires that we have. And he says that they wage war against our soul. These desires of the flesh and things we want in this world, they, they wage war against our soul. That, that's a good description of anxiety, isn't it? As our soul is, is waging war. On the inside, we're in turmoil. And once again, I think much of it comes from chasing after these things, these desires, trying to be something, to attain something in this world, to to latch our hope into, to tether our identity to. Today, um, Scotty Scheffler is... uh, currently leading the, the FedEx uh, golf tournament. And if he wins today and he's in the lead, you may not know Scotty Scheffler. First of all, he's a, he's a golfer. He's the uh, number one golfer in the world. Had a phenomenal year. And so this is kind of the culmination event of the year. He's already won the Masters and uh, several other tournaments. But the winner today gets $25 million for the tournament. $25 million from winning golf tournament. Now, uh, you may think, well, what's, you know, I'd, be, I'd settle for, you know, a small fraction of that. But a golfer, I mean, that's basically how they earn their, their living, right? You're standing over a putt, maybe six feet away, and, you know, you have to make this putt, and $25 million is, is riding on this putt. And it's interesting. They've, they've made a big deal about Scotty Scheffler, not just because he's an excellent golfer, because, but because how calm he seems in those moments, uh, he, doesn't seem to let, he, he doesn't seem to let things bother him like other golfers. And they questioned him about that several years ago after they won the Master and even since then. And this is what he says. He says, I believe that today's plan, speaking of, of you know, him, this, this day where he has to go out and perform on the golf course. He said, I believe that today's plans were already laid out many years ago. And I could do nothing to mess up those plans. And he says, my identity is not found in my next golf shot and winning the next golf tournament. No, my identity is found in Christ, in Jesus Christ. And they talk about how he has this balance between, you know, cares a lot. Obviously, he wants to win, and I would say the same thing, right? We, we need, to, there's certain things we need to care about in this world that are important, but our identity need but not be tethered to those things those desires, when our identity and our worth and our hope is, is anchored to those desires, that's when anxiety and worry begin to creep in, needlessly creep in. And so we set our minds upon this hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And as we do that, certain desires that we have don't, don't fit into that. And we're going to see 
this new way that we are to live, not according to these old desires, but, but this new way that he's going to lay out for us to live. And, and if I could give this underlying truth that is a foundation for this new direction of life that he's going to call us to live, I would say this, and I think this is probably sums up in some ways, First Peter chapter 1, it's this. Our Heavenly Father has chosen us to be his children through the precious blood of Jesus Our Heavenly Father has chosen us to be His children through the precious blood of His Son, Jesus. That that is the the, the foundation of who we are. And that is the shaping reality for the way we're going to see, for the way that we should live. That we've been brought into God's family through the gospel. We've experienced this great salvation through Uh, the death and the resurrection of God's son, Jesus. And now this is my identity. This is your identity that you, we are his children, that he is our heavenly father. And in light of that, he continues on. And notice what he says in verse 15. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. Uh, That word conduct, it's uh, going to be an important one in the next few verses. It's an important word to uh, Peter. Uh, Actually, there there are 13 times when that word for conduct is used in the New Testament, and eight of them are found in 1 and 2 Peter. And we see it three different times here in these verses. And the word conduct there, it means, it speaks to a, it's not just your, your actions in a moment, it speaks to a pattern of life. Conduct there speaks to a, a way of, of living, your, your everyday living, like the everyday choices that you make, um, your everyday relationships, your, your everyday work. And he's saying this, don't let your desires, these desires you have, in the flesh, don't let them, don't let them set the pattern of your life. Set the pattern of your life, number one, after your heavenly father. Our lives should be patterned, should be lived in light of who our heavenly father is. Like a, like a child imitates his son. I remember uh, not uh, several years ago, I was sitting in the office at the house and I had a hat on and I had it on backwards and uh, my son came busting through the doors. He had a hat on. He was wearing his hat normal and um, he kind of just stopped for a minute and looked at me and looked at, I could tell he was just kind of examining me a little bit. And then he walked out and then a few seconds he came back in and he turned his hat around, right? He was, he was mimicking the way, I guess he'd never seen anybody wear their, their hat that way before. He's mimicking the way that I wore my hat and that's what we do. We imitate our fathers in, in, in some of the smallest ways, even some of the biggest ways. I remember as a child uh, seeing my father out there mowing the grass and I would want to go out there and mow the grass until he started letting me mow the grass and I did, no longer wanted to mow the grass. But it's part of growing up, right? That we see our, our father and we imitate them in the same way as those who have been saved by God and brought into his family and he is our heavenly father. Now our lives are to imitate him who is holy. He's holy. Now, what does that mean? That we are to imitate our holy heavenly father? Well, most of us think of holy as being, uh, having good morals, right? Living righteously. And uh, we've all heard the phrase, you know, being holier than thou. And you're, when, when you hear somebody accuse you of being holier than thou, they're saying, what, your, your behavior is, you know, is superior. You're kind of a, maybe they're even calling you a goody two-shoes. But the word holy is actually much more, uh, there's a lot more depth to the word holy. Uh, this phrase, because I be holy, because I am holy, is actually first found in the book of Leviticus. And it's, uh, it's all over the place in the book of Leviticus. It's actually kind of the foundation for biblical ethics, right? This be holy because God is holy. In the book of Leviticus, if you've ever read that, it, it's basically God laying out for his people how they are to live. And he addresses the clothing that they wear, their diet, their relationships with others, their worship. It's pretty comprehensive. God desires for his people to live differently from the surrounding nations. 
And the reason he was calling them to live differently is so they would stand out because they were to not reflect the surrounding nations, they were to reflect him. And so when he says be holy, the idea of being holy means to be set apart. When we say that God is holy, we're saying, God, you are set apart. There is no one, there is nothing like you. In the same way, when God says that we are to be holy, we are to be set apart. We're to be a people that are different from the world around us. And there's a couple of ways I think we're to, to be set apart. Uh, first of all, we're to be set apart for his glory. Uh, we're not to live according to the patterns of this world, right? What are the patterns of this world? Well, in this world, the highest goal, specifically in our society, I think is, is to be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want. When it comes down to it, I think that's kind of what people want in this life. People live and try to acquire wealth and power to express themselves as individuals. And the ultimate goal is to be able to do whatever you want and you know, whenever you want. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus describes this uh, to a man who's building big barns and acquiring wealth. And he says, this man, is, his goal is to relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And that's kind of the American dream, isn't it? I mean, to, to relax, to be able to, to get to a place in life where you can relax and eat and drink, marry. And, and what we need to see in Scripture is that you were made for more than that. That ultimately, that way of living, apart from God, is, is a dead end. That you are not made to focus on self and to be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want. No, the highest goal in this life is to live for his glory, to, to do what he wants, to leverage your life for him. This is what we are made for. And we see this in the life of Jesus. If you want to know what your heavenly father looks like, what holiness looks like to your heavenly father, well, then we know that Jesus is the perfect image of our father. He came in the flesh to show us what God looks like. And what does his life look like? Did it look like a life of a guy was running around and doing whatever he wanted, whatever he wanted? That was not his ultimate goal. His goal was to glorify his father through this self-giving love and sacrifice. Jesus was a man who, who wasn't acquiring things for himself. And ultimately, even on the cross, he was stripped from the clothes on his back. He held his, he held his, his um, possessions, what few he had with open hands. That's what it means to live or be set apart for God's glory. It means that, that we hold things loosely, everything in our lives, and we leverage them for, for him and his glory, his will, his purpose. We're also set apart to be godly. We're not just meant to be different from the world for, for differentness sake, right? No, we're to be, uh, we're not just supposed to be different from the world. We're supposed to be like our heavenly father. And that's an important distinction. Because it's possible to be, I mean, we live in a pretty, uh, you know, messed up world, broken world. And it's easy to, to appear to be a good person in this world, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't require much to, to stand out and be a little different in this world. But trying to be good according to this world's standards is not the goal. No, godliness Godliness is the goal. To be holy like our Father is holy is to mean, means to be, be holy in the way, be different in the way that he's different, to reflect his character. And godliness goes beyond what appears to be good in, uh, in outward behavior. Uh, no, godliness begins on the inside with our hearts. And, and we see Jesus even talking about this, don't we? Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about, um, you know, in, in this world where you're supposed to love people and treat people nice, right? You're supposed to do good things to your neighbor. Jesus comes along and says, no, not just your neighbor, but your enemies as well. That's what it means to be godly. Anybody can love the people who love you. No, those who, that, that, that's a good person. No, those who desire to be godly, they'll love those who curse you. 
anybody can be a good person and not be violent and, 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 and murder, right? I mean, that's, that's not a high standard. I mean, it, maybe it is in some ways in this world, not be given to violence. No, Jesus comes along and says, I tell you, if you're, if you're angry at your brother, if you treat your brother in your heart as if he's worthless, that's, that's, that's like murder. You're treating him as if he has no value. Once again, adultery in this world, it's, for the most part, it's frowned upon, still is, and some, at least in our culture, our society here. But Jesus comes along and he says, no, it's not just about the physical act of adultery. He, he takes it a step further. He says, no, godliness is this, that if you even look at someone and lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. And so godliness is much different than the world's definition of, of being good. And I would say this for anyone who's, you know, if you're out there dating and, and you're looking for someone to, to ultimately marry, and I think that's kind of the, the purpose of dating, I would say this, be careful that you distinguish between good and godly. As a believer, you should be looking for someone who's demonstrating godliness. Someone, when it comes to morality, is not just asking the question, well, is this permissible? You know, how far can I go here? What can I do? Is this permissible? Do I see anything in the Bible that doesn't, is against this? Or are they asking the question, is this beneficial? It's Paul question, uh, the question Paul asked in, in 1 Corinthians. Is it beneficial? Is this thing going to spur me on in godliness? That's the kind of person, if you're a Christian, right? If you've set your heart and your mind upon Jesus Christ and you are setting the pattern after your, uh, of your life after your Holy Father, as we see Jesus doing, then you're going to live in a way where you are seeking to do things and, and allow things in your life that stir, spur you on into holiness, you're also to set the pattern of your life in reverent fear of your heavenly father. Not just after his holiness, but also you're to set the pattern of your life or your conduct in reverent fear of your heavenly father. Look again, he uses the word conduct, that same word in verse 17. He says, if you appeal to the father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence, fear, reverence during your time living as strangers. Some might have that word um, reverence translated as fear. And I think that's probably the, the better translation. It's the, uh, the Greek word is phobos, which is the word we get phobia from. And reverence is also, uh, I think, important to understand there. So I put reverent fear. Now, I want to state first and clearly that we know as believers, right, that we are saved by grace through faith. That the works here that um, Peter's referring to are, are not these works that we do in order to be made right with God. We're not saved by our own performance. But we do see in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are saved by grace through faith in order to do good works. We're not saved by our works, but we're saved for works. And so as we do these works, as we live our life, we're to do these works in reverence, right? In, in reverent fear of our heavenly father. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to fear our heavenly father? Well, does it mean we're to be afraid of him? Well, I, I don't think so, but in a way, yes. There is an appropriate fear that a child should have of his or her father. Right? I, I pray that my children would never fear that I'm going to reject them or, or send them away. I pray that my children would never fear that I'm going to hurt them in some way that's right that to, to do something that's not what's best for them I don't want them to fear that I don't think we should fear our heavenly father in that way but there is right a healthy fear that a child should have for a father who has authority over him or her because that father is responsible to take care of the child to discipline the child and when you tell a child not to go too 
close to the edge of a cliff, that child may not understand the danger there, right? They may walk right up to that cliff and not think anything of it, but they do understand what it means to fear their father. And so even though they don't understand the danger they might might be upon them with, with this drop from this cliff, hopefully they will be obedient and, and do what's right because they fear their father. They have a healthy fear of their father. And listen, I, I think that's what Peter is getting at here. There is, there's an appropriate fear that we should have, a reverent fear that we should have for our heavenly father. Because he is creator Right? He is Savior, but he is also judge. And I think what he's getting at here, specifically when it comes to anxiety, is that an appropriate fear of God can drive out other inappropriate fears. A fear unto God will hopefully drive out lesser unhealthy fears. Uh, in, in the same way that if a uh, picture that you were on a plane... And you got on that plane and um, you were running late. You know, you forgot some, you forgot your laptop. You needed it for this work. You, you're more than likely you're going to miss your next flight. You, you sit down and you're in the middle seat. There are people all around you. I mean, you're just, a, you're just annoyed and you're, you're stressed. And you're, you know, 20,000 feet in the air. Then all of a sudden that pilot comes over and says, listen, we've lost both engines Embrace to, to crash. Now, in that moment, only one thing matters. Only one fear in that moment matters. All these other things, the fact that you might miss your next plane or you forgot what you needed for work or the fact that you have the middle seat, right? All those things are still out there. Nothing there has changed but this one fear that, you're, that your life is in danger, right? That this plane is about to crash drives out these other fears. In the same way, listen, I think an appropriate fear, a healthy, reverent fear of God in a way can drive out unhealthy fears. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 10. He says something very interesting to his disciples who he knows they're going to be facing persecution, he knows he's going to be facing those who are going to come against them and, and they have, they'll have reasons to be afraid. He says these words. He says, don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. He cares for you. So listen to what Jesus is saying. There are two things at work here when it comes to our fear of, of worldly things. Okay? And, and whatever you're afraid of here, whatever, you, whatever might be coming your way that, that's stressing you and causing you anxiety. He's saying, listen, first of all, don't be afraid of those who might persecute you. Why? Because they can only hurt your body, okay? A reverent fear understands that God is the one who, sh who should obey, who you should follow because he can destroy your body and your soul, okay? So in some ways he's saying, be afraid of God, understand who he is, that he is sovereign over your body and your soul. But then he comes along and says something else and it's weird, it's this contrast. But know this about this heavenly father who can destroy you body and soul. Know that he also knows the number of hairs on your head. That there's not a sparrow that hits the ground that he doesn't know about, that he's not concerned about. And so, yes, God, you are to have this reverent fear of him, but also know this. He cares deeply for you down to, the, to, to every hair on your head, that's our heavenly father that we are to live in reverent fear of. So set the pattern of your life in reverent fear, understanding he is, he is our heavenly father. He has authority, he has power, he's to be respected, adhered to. Don't, don't take his discipline lightly. But at the same time, he, he loves you. He loves you down to the finest detail of your life. Then finally, 
set the pattern of your life knowing you have been redeemed by your heavenly father through the precious blood of his son, Jesus. Set the pattern of your life, set your conduct. The third place we see this word conduct is actually there in verse 18. Peter writes, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life. That, that word there for way of life, it's the same Greek word that he translates earlier, the word conduct. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty conduct, your empty pattern of living that you inherited from your fathers. And, and he's going to do a, a contrast here. He's going he's to contrast what... Uh, that the earthly fathers have passed along to their children in comparison to what he, the heavenly father, offers and gives to his children. And first he says, before you were brought into the, the family of God, before you knew the gospel, you were living in the ways uh, of those who came before you, right? The fathers, I don't think he's necessarily talking specifically about their particular fathers. I think he's talking about the, the men who came before them. And he says, before you came to know the gospel and became children of God, you were just the, the children of men. And as children of men, you are living in the ways of this world. You are living in ways of things that will not last, perishable things. And he says, this pattern of life was, he calls it empty. Uh, another way to translate would just translate that would be useless. And every society that exists has these patterns that are passed down, right? These ways of life, these traditions that are passed down from fathers to their children, right? Fathers and mothers to their children, on and on and on. And, and for us in, in this country, just to be specific, we would call it the American way, right? We, we have been, there's been something passed down to us, right? The, the American way. And uh, maybe you would sum up the, the American way and... and different terms than these, but I think it's, you, you work hard, right? You make something of your, yourself. Everybody has opportunity. Um, you, can, you can dream. I mean, that's the, the message we've heard today, you know, dream and you can be anything that you, you want to be. You can, you can grow to be strong and powerful. The American way is to do, do things, right, through a, through a process where those who have power, right, politicians and, and whatnot, right, we, we, we give them power and authority. And so we, we come along and we choose them. We seek to choose them wisely because they, they make a difference. The American way is to acquire things kind of follows that American dream that we talked about earlier, to acquire things that, that will make your life good and, and to take care of your, yourself. And here's what I want to submit to you this morning is that I think many of the things that now that we are worried about threaten the, the American way. And I'm not saying any of these things are bad. Okay, I love my country. I love the opportunities that exist here. 100% work hard and, and do everything you can. Live a life that's diligent and, and uh, for, uh, for, the, for your interest and the interest of others. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I want to look at it apart from, apart from Jesus, right, the American way, it's it's. It's, it doesn't end anything. It's, it's a dead end. And if we're not careful, much of our life can be prone to living out, right, these traditions and things that have been passed down from those who lived before us and finding our worth and value and these things, right? And you can, uh, across the room, they may add up to different things. Maybe you're worried about your grades or maybe you're worried about a job or maybe you're worried about a relationship status or a group that you're in or not in. Or maybe you're worried about finding someone one day that you, will, that you will marry or having kids. I mean, all these things we can sum up and in some way or another, we can see how they've been passed down to us and they're not bad things in and of themselves, but if we, if we make them what our lives are about, then they can become these monsters. 
that cause us to doubt God's care, his love, that can bring stress in our life. And what Peter is saying is, listen, all these things, they're not necessarily bad things, but in the end, apart from Christ, they're, they're useless, they're vain, they're, they're empty. And in the presence of your heavenly Father one day, you'll see that. They're empty. They may uh, appear as momentary gain, but it's an illusion. It will not last. But your heavenly Father, in contrast to what's been passed down to you uh, from uh, from your earthly fathers, your heavenly Father has come and redeemed you from those things. He's rescued you from those things. Don't let those things weigh you down. Don't let those things control you. Don't let those desires for those things be the pattern of your living and and bring about all kinds of anxious thoughts. No, your heavenly father has redeemed you from that bondage from being a slave to those things. And he did so not with perishable things like you received from your earthly fathers, like silver and gold. No, he redeemed you the precious blood of his son, Jesus. And this redemption was destined before the foundations of the world. This is your heavenly father and his care for you. This is the love that he has displayed for you. And so don't conduct your life, right, caught up in all these things. No, conduct your life with an understanding that you have been rescued from these things at the most precious cost. That word redeemed, it may be translated ransomed. But it's uh, the word um, where a slave would be purchased. If you're a slave uh, uh, during those days, it more than likely you could not take care of yourself or your family, and so you would sell yourself into slavery under to someone else's care, under someone else's authority. And so there would be these slave markets, and you would be up for sale. And so there would be an auction, and you know one person may say, and I don't know the equivalent of of the money, you know, a thousand dollars. And the picture here is that this auction where slaves are being ransomed, sold, a voice comes out of nowhere and says, I'll give my son. I'll give my son for that slave. That's the picture here. That you and I were being sold as slaves in that market. And this voice from heaven came down and said, I'll give the precious blood of my son to redeem that person, to redeem you. So they don't have to continue in these empty ways. So they can be brought in and made a part of my family. And so they can live, think, and live differently. Not for temporary things, but for eternal things. That are secured in an unfading inheritance. Secured by the death and resurrection of my son, Jesus. That's what you've been given. So let's set our hearts and minds on that truth, that reality, and let's let the patterns of our life follow our thinking. Let's pray together. For a minute, I just want to be real practical with you. And would you just bow your head and consider maybe some of the things that you're afraid of? What are the things that are causing you to be anxious or worried?
And would you ask your heavenly father to show you the root of those things? Would you confront those things? 